has calculated the tif typical lifespan of how 70 years is spent. And here's the estimate. Sleep 23 years, or what represents 32.9% of our lives. Work 16 years, 22.8%. TV 8 years, 11.4%. Eating 6 years, 8.6%. Traveling 6 years, 8.6%. Leisure Four and a half years, or six and a half percent. Illness, four years, 5.7 percent. Getting dressed, two years, or 2.8 percent. And then sadly, religion, half a year, or 0.7 percent. Now, I don't mean, know if they mean by religion as just going to services or reading the Bible or praying or all of them there. But that's pretty sad that that is half a year. When the reality is, is that come, church, living a Christian life is not just Sunday mornings. It's not coming here for a few hours on a Sunday and then going do whatever else we want the rest of the week. We're to live a godly life, and that's why we're going through Proverbs, that it is wisdom for life, that the Bible teaches that all Scripture is profitable. It talks about for doctrine, for proof, for correction and training in righteousness. It's, it's profitable for living a godly life. And so this morning... We're going to look at four areas. We're going to continue through these six more sayings. And we come to the third one, which is setting the right priorities in life. Setting the right priorities. Proverbs 24, 27. Prepare your work outside and make it ready for yourself in the field. Afterwards, then build your house. Now we would be thinking, maybe how does this even uh, apply to us? Because in ancient times, think about what would be wiser, especially in an agricultural setting, agrarian society. Would building your home first and using most of your resources to build a large home and then use what is left over to build what you need to farm the land, whether it be to buy seed, to plow, to store the crops, vineyard, you need a wall around it because that's what they would do to keep out animals and, the, and, it, and people that should not be in there. Would that be wise to do to whatever left over? Or would it be to put most of my resources into planting a vineyard, building a wall to protect the vines, building a barn to store my produce, buying the tools and seed that I need to plow, plant, and harvest? Then build what is left over to, if it means to build a modest home or to live in a tent for a little while. Then when you're doing well, you build a nicer home. And then this person could be, think about having a family because he could provide for them. It is far better to secure food and resources first than build a home. Practically speaking, in that type of situation, you would need to know how productive that land is first. It would have been a waste of time to build a home on that land that is magnificent. And then you find out that this land isn't good for, like I, this land isn't good for, or at least this part of my land is not good for growing. And now I have to go find a different part of my property or a different land to grow. It would have been a total waste of time to have that thing have that reverse to build that house. And so, how does this even apply to us? And Well, proper preparations need to be made in life. I mean, in the case of this person, proper pre preparations we need to be made. To plow the land, to plant, to harvest, to you grain, gain resources and you build a better home. But what does this have to do with us? Because how many of us are going to buy a piece of property, 
are going to think about building on it, think about planting crops. I don't think any of us right now, that now sometimes it's tempting to do that because of the way food prices are and the way everything is going, that you do see more people going that way, buying land, and they're becoming, that they, they want to have livestock and they want to have crops, they want to have all this and be self-sufficient. But there's more that this verse can teach us. Teach us how to live for God. It's wise to set the right priorities and do what is most important first, or you'll have chaos if you don't. Because that, in the case of this person, the right priority was to find out if this land is productive. The plant, well, the so, I should say that he needed first to plow and plant and harvest. That was the proper, proper uh, priority. To build a wall around his vineyard, to protect it from from animals and, and and people who shouldn't be in there. And so, for us in life and really anything, we need to have our priorities right and do what is most important first. But also in preparation, we need to do, as I say, instead of our priorities right, we need to have proper preparation. And that's what Solomon did when building the temple. And in addition to what his father donated, his, do, his dad donated all these resources, King David, before he passed away, even actually gave him the plans to do it, still Solomon had more preparation and prepared for what he needed to do to build the temple. 1 Kings 5, 17-18 tells us this, Then the king commanded, and they quarried great stones, costly stones, that lay the foundations of the house to, with cut stones. So Solomon builders and Hiram's builders and the Gebulites cut them and prepared the timbers and the stones to build the house. And the first king, 6, 7, the house, why it was being built, was built of stone, prepared the quarry. And neither were... And there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron tool heard in the house where it was being built. Now what would have happened if Solomon didn't make proper preparations? If he just said, you know what, I'm going to just, you know, my dad gave me some resources. I got the plans. Let's just build this and see how it goes. He could have ran out of materials. And then you would have a temple that was incomplete that you would have this building that would be incomplete. That's what would have happened to him if he didn't gather everything that he was needed and make proper preparations. Well, in life, we need to have the right proper priorities and we need to prepare. We need to have plans. Even planning out your day and what you need to accomplish is not just plans for what I want to do in 20 years from now, what I would like to do for the Lord, all these things, but even daily life, planning out your day, what you want to accomplish, because if you don't, you're going to find out you didn't accomplish anything but waste of the day. Because even you need to plan. Plan for when you read God's Word. Plan for when you're going to pray. Spending time with the Lord. If you don't, you're going to find at the end of the day, your time is gone. And I didn't read God's word. I didn't pray. I didn't spend time with him. When in reality that that should be one of the first things we do. It's one of the most important things to do is to spend time. But reality is, is that we need to plan what we are going to accomplish. Write them down. Make plans. But we entrust those plans to the Lord as well even just the small plans in life, that we entrust God because God is the one that establishes plans. He's the one that allows things to happen, or He doesn't. We entrust Him to the Lord. But we still need to make plans. We still, make, still need to make preparations. We still need to have the right priorities in life. And in any situation, because before, the, the main application of this passage was is that a young man if he wants to get married he needs to have a job and have some place of residence and then he can get married 
But it's more than that. Just the application is is more than just limited to that. Even that sound advice that you should have a job, you should have a place to be able to provide. But also in life, plans, priorities need the most important things need to happen first. Accomplish the most important things at the beginning of your day and make plans of how you're going to accomplish things, how you're going to, if you set goals and plans for the future, you didn't make preparation. How am I going to even accomplish these plans and not just go by a whim? The fourth more wise saying is tell the truth about your neighbor. Verse 28. Do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your lips. Christians don't lie about their neighbors. Christians don't wit are not a witness against someone because of out of revenge, because that some did something that person did something to me. I am going to make them pay, so I'm going to say something bad about them, so they're going to get in trouble. Christians don't gossip. They don't slander. They don't say something if well, they don't say something that they're not sure that's true or not. The world does. They'll be like, "Hey, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is true or not, but did you hear this?" I mean, the news does it a lot too. You see that all the time on social media, even by people that they'll spread rumors and lies, and they don't know if it's true or not. But hey, if it gets people to listen, if it gets likes, if it gets ratings in my news, but that's not the way, that's the way of the world. That's the way of Christ. And so this verse emphasizes the importance of telling truth because God loves truth and God hates lies. God is a God of truth. We have seen all throughout the book of Proverbs that God loves the truth and the importance of a wise person who's going to live a godly life because wisdom is not just for the head, it's for living a life that honors God, a life that is walking and growing in sanctification, that's growing to become more like Christ. And so we've seen throughout the book of Proverbs, the Proverbs that often repeats itself in different ways. It'll say that we're, it tells us to speak the truth, but it tells us in different ways so that we remember. Because we're going to be tempted when we're mad. We may be tempted to say something bad about somebody. We may t be tempted to spread gossip. We may be tempted to lie about someone. But the Bible emphasizes the importance of telling truth. And all of the Proverbs that have told us about the truth are based on the ninth commandment. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor, Exodus 20, verse 16. Exodus 20, 16, that we don't have to bear false witness. We don't have to lie, because God is God's truth. Satan is the father of lies. And in case we have, in case we have forgotten... Where Solomon has warned us about the devastating effects of what happens when lies are allowed, even in the courtroom, injustice, or in our lives, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in the White House, and anywhere. The devastating effects, Proverbs 6.19 says, A false witness who utter lies and one who spreads strife among brothers. A person who speaks lies is spreading strife. They're causing problems. That is the effects that lies have. It causes problems. It causes strife, fighting. trustworthy witness will not lie but a false witness utters lies these lies destroy lives proverbs 14:25 a truthful witness saves lives but he who utters lies is treacherous destroy destruction in the case of a courtroom setting 
it has devastating effects. Somebody's going to jail for something they didn't do. But here now that their family can't see them that often, can't provide, could even send them to the electric chair because of lies. Or could let somebody go that is guilty, and then they go on and destroy lives. Lying makes a mockery of justice. It, may, it spreads evil everywhere it goes. Proverbs 19.28, a rascally witness makes a mockery of justice. The mouth of the wicked spreads iniquity. They spread iniquity. This is all over the place. You ever stepped in, in mud? And you just started wherever you went for a while. You see those mud footprints? Well, that's what this wicked person does who lies. They're spreading iniquity, spreading evil where they go. And that way leads to death. Proverbs 20, 20, 21, 28, a false witness will perish. But the man who listens to the truth will speak forever. Their way leads to death and leads to destruction. The man of integrity, the man who speaks the truth, is a man who shows himself that he knows God and loves God and is born again, and that he will live forever with God. So look at verse 28 again. Do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your lips. The only time that a Christian should be a witness against a neighbor is when there is a cause. Because you notice it says, without cause. When there is a cause that's committed because of a crime, or there's some, something that's happened where you need to tell the truth. Not just in a courtroom setting, but maybe the workplace. Or in church. The truth. This means that you don't spread gossip, slander, Rumors about people, lies, because God hates those things. Proverbs 16, 20 says, A perverse man spreads strife, and a slanderer separates intimate friends. That's what lies do. And so we speak the truth, is what we do. We speak the truth. We live a life of integrity, and we speak the truth. And when we commit these sins... When we, tell the, when we lie, we confess that to the Lord. We find grace. Not that we're looking for an excuse to sin and take advantage of God's grace, but we know that when we do sin, that God will forgive. If we confess our sins to Him, He will forgive. And so, a life of integrity even loves your enemies. See, Christians are different. They, they speak the truth, and you love your enemies. Verse 29. Do not say, thus shall I shall do to him as he done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. What is that all about? What does that mean to do as he done to me? I will, I will render to the man according to his work. I mean, why are you told not to say these things? What is going on in this verse? Well, one, it has nothing doing to do with being kind back to someone. You know, this person did something nice for me. I am going to show them kindness back. Or, you know, I want to I get them a gift and a thank you. And those, that has nothing to do with that. It actually has to do with revenge, that I am going to get them back. They did this to me, I will repay them, and I will get them back. And by now, we have noticed, and should have noticed, the book of Proverbs repeats itself over and over again in different ways. Just as the book of Proverbs repeats itself with, with that we speak the truth, we see this principle of warning about revenge. Because Proverbs 20, 22 says, Do not say, I'll repay. Wait for the Lord, and He will save you. In a fallen world, 
it is tempting to get revenge. Is that not the way of the ungodly? Is that not the way of the unsaved, that revenge? And we shouldn't be surprised when people who are unsaved get, seek to get revenge or talk about revenge and hatred and anger and bitterness. It shouldn't surprise us because we would be the same way if we were not saved by the grace of God. But that is the way of the world. That's the way of the devil to get people back for what they've done. And if you're a Christian, there is a struggle that goes on. A war, a battle, that I have a choice. This person has been mean to me, so what am I going to do? Am I going to get revenge? Am I going to pay back? Am I going to do evil back to them? Or am I going to do what God says? Am I, though they have treated me wrongly, I'm going to obey the Lord. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe what God says. Because God says in His Word that He will take revenge. Revenge is mine. Even Proverbs 20, 22 that says that here, wait for the Lord, He will save you, that it's God who repays. God is Word. And we know, you know, the reality is, is that we know these things. It's not that we don't know them. It's do we believe them? Do we trust the Lord? Because Deuteronomy 32, 35 says, Vengeance is mine, and retribution due time their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastened upon them. God says, Vengeance is mine. That it belongs to him. And Paul quotes from that verse as well in Romans. 12, 17 through 19. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect was right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For as written, vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. So God says that vengeance belongs to him. That I'm not to pay evil, repay evil for evil. And so what am I going to do? Am I going to believe God that it belongs to him? Have I ever thought about why is God the only one who has the right to repay? Why hasn't God given us that right to take revenge and vengeance? Why does it belong to the Lord? Well, one is because He is God. He is a judge of the entire earth. He's the only judge who's ever, who ever existed that has perfect knowledge, that is, we know, omniscience. There's not a human judge that can say that. In the courtroom, a judge has to be presented with the evidence. So you have to have the defense attorney who presents the evidence that his client is not, is not guilty, They're actually innocent. Or, and then you have on the other side, you have the prosecuting attorney that brings the evidence that has been collected to say, hey, no, this person is guilty. And the judge doesn't have knowledge of those things. And so he has to listen there and make a decision. And even then, he's going to have to make the best decision that he can. Especially if you have a trial that doesn't have a jury. If somebody skip, if waves that right and has it just the judge make the decision rather than the judge bases his decision on what he has heard to sentence that person based upon if that person was found guilty by the jury. But this person doesn't, the judge, human judge doesn't know. The prosecuting attorney doesn't have perfect knowledge. If you ever listen to a court case, they'll say this person's motive was this. Well, the reality is, is that they're most likely guessing based on evidence because maybe that person, because they think that person's motive was, for example, was, 
oh, they were they had all debt to they had so much debt, and so they were desperate, and so they, that's why they robbed this bank, or that's why they killed their spouse for the life insurance money. This is why they did these things. But even then, they're guessing. God knows all the facts. He knows people's motives. He knows why people have done what they've done. God doesn't allow his emotions to cloud his judgment because when we want to take revenge, we're angry or frustrated, we're mad, and the reality is that we want that person to pay, but we want to do worse to them. And sometimes it's because of misunderstanding. Oh, they did that to me because of, and we can name it off, but reality is if we actually talk to them, we might find out, you know what, that was a misunderstanding. That didn't happen like you thought it did. But So God knows. God knows all those things, whether that, perpen, per, that person purposely did evil to you or they did it because, you know what, it's a misunderstanding. It was an accident. And so God is the God who is the judge. God knows perfectly. He will punish in his perfect timing. And he has the right to do that. We take comfort in that. We have to trust God. There is a battle in your mind of will I trust him or not? Choose to trust him. The unsaved world scoffs at that idea. The idea, as I said earlier, was to get back. It's revenge. Even some would say that revenge is best, is a dish best served cold. Meaning that you wait. You wait, even if it's years. They don't like the idea of waiting on God. They that is the way of the world, and that leads to this in Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife. That is the way they're going, and we don't be like the world. So take it instead of revenge, this is what we're to do. As Jesus said, we're to love our enemies. Matthew 5, 43-46. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your neighbors and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. So we're told to love our enemies, not just to love those who are kind to us, but to love our enemies. We're going to pray for them. That's the first practical way, is to pray for them. We pray that God would change their hearts. We pray for their salvation. We pray for opportunities to do good to them. We pray for opportunities to share the gospel to them. This is Matthew 5.44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that those who do evil to you. Second is you do good to them. Proverbs 25.21-22 through 22, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you heat burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. And even Paul quotes in Romans 12 those verses. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You notice at the end, he said how overcome evil and what people do to you is to overcome it by good. If they're hungry, we feed them. If they're thirsty, give them a drink. God will repay in his perfect timing. But we don't ever pay back evil for evil. And we don't ever pay back that here when people do evil to, when we do good to people and they do evil back to us, we don't go and do evil to them. We continue to do good. We do what is right. And you defeat evil by 
not be getting revenge, but by coming, overcoming it with good. That's how we love our enemies. We pray for them. We do good to them. And third, we forgive them. That is a hard thing to do. We don't allow, you know, it's forgiveness. Especially when somebody doesn't ask us to forgive them. And they continue doing evil. But we can't allow bitterness and anger to take root in our hearts. We forgive. Matthew 6, 14-15 For if you give, forgive others for their transgressions, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them, give others, then your Father will not forgive you your transgressions. And remember that we, we forgive. We forgive, and it's a wonderful thing if some, when somebody comes to us and says, you know, I'm sorry, I did this to you. And you may see that when you do good to someone, that eventually somebody will say, come and say, you know what? I don't understand why, why you like this. Why, why are you like this? I was just watching this week. I was cleaning out. Uh, I found some DVDs that I had. And I was cleaning them out, and one, uh, one of them was on these testimonies of, of different Christians around the world, especially in Asia. And this one took place in India where this pastor, this young man, went into this village and was preaching Christ. Well, he had people come up to him angrily. That this, they're saying, this is a Hindu village. We don't want your Christ and they beat him up. And they actually dragged him out and threw him into a pit. But later that day, one of the men, his conscience started bothering him. That here that this pastor kept on coming and kept on doing good to them. And here he, they dragged him out and did evil to him and left him for dead. He went down into that pit dragged him, I mean, not dragged him, carried him out, I'm sorry, not dragged him, but carried him out on his shoulders, brought him home, and him and his wife fed, fed him and cared for him. And a lot of people came, out, came to know Christ out of that. In fact, he's that, pa that young man, the pastor of that village now. And there's multi many people who come to faith in Christ, many of whom that have were persecuting him and beat him up and left him from dead. You never know. And I've used that story of even a young boy who had an enemy that would bully him and torture him. I'm going to make a long story short that even ended up killing his cat, throwing it off the building. And he, when he went to Sunday school, he was confronted with that verse to love your enemies. And he didn't want to do that at first. He was actually happy when the boy that caused him problems in his apartment building got sick. But that verse kept on of that you're to do good. To, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And that verse kept on going through his mind. And he eventually went went first just to give him something to eat and drink because in a bad attitude and that I'm just okay I'm going to bathe this I'll be done but eventually he started doing it because he wanted to and he was kind to this young man and this boy was getting very sick but he also came to Christ because he said you know what I'm sorry I'm sorry I did that to your cat I'm sorry the way I've treated you so you don't know how the Lord will use those things. But no matter what happens, we're to do good. That's what God calls us to do. And we're to trust God. We're, go we're to love our enemies and leave room for God's wrath. And then sixth, laziness will destroy you. Proverbs 30, 34. I passed by the field, in verses 30 and 31, of the sluggard by the vineyard of the man lacking sense, and behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles, its surface was covered with nettles, and a stone wall was broken down. Notice that what Psalm is doing, he's passing by a lazy man's property. He calls him a sluggard. 
Do you remember what a sluggard is? From Scripture? From Proverbs? It's a lazy person who has the ability to work and be active and refuses to. That word sluggard is used 14 times in the book of Proverbs. None of them are ever used in a positive sense. The Bible rebukes a sluggard and warns them of the consequences of the path they're on. GodQuestions.org defines a sluggard as this. A sluggard is someone who is habitually lazy or inactive. Such a person does not take personal responsibility for his own life. Raymond Ortland Jr. writes this, Think of the way syrup oozes slowly out of a bottle when it's cold. That is a slugger, sluggish and slow and hesitant, when he should be decisive, active, forthright. His life motto is, don't rush me. He then quotes Proverbs 26, 14, As a door turns on its hinges, so does a slugger on his bed. And then he continues, he's lazy, constantly making the soft choice, losing one opportunity after another, after another, day by day, moment by moment, until he lies there, helpless in a wasted life. Let's all admit it, there's a slugger deep inside each of us. So Solomon calls him a sluggard. Solomon calls him a man lacking sense. So why does Solomon call that? How does Solomon know that this property is owned by a sluggard? because of what he observed. Because this man's property was overgrown with thistles and nettles and taken the place of the grapevines. And the stone wall was broken down. That's how he could tell, he could tell it was a vineyard. What was left of a vineyard should be. Did the man plant those nettles and thistles, those thorns and such and weeds? No. Did the man break down his wall? No. But because of his laziness and not did anything to maintain his property when he could have, when those thorns and when those weeds and all that stuff was little, could have got rid of them. And if you're somebody who owns a lot of property, I mean, if you're wealthier, you have servants to help you. But because of his laziness and not doing anything, he might as well planted them himself. And because of his laziness, he might have might as well torn down the wall with his own hands. Because it would have been much easier when the when there's the cracks in the wall to go and make repairs. Versus it's completely fallen down. It would be much easier to go make little repairs. But this also did not happen overnight. It wasn't like six months later this happened. This is years of neglect and laziness. I mean, have you ever seen a property that's been neglected? I mean, the grass is tall. We're t I mean, sometimes the grass is up to your shoulders. The fence is falling down and missing sections. The porch is falling apart. There's vines growing all over the house. And I know there are some people who like those vines growing on their house. But I just saw this week in my neighborhood, workers tearing vines off of a home and filling up one of those, not, not the dumpsters you see at workplaces, but those flat dumpsters. Those ones that, come, that you can get them, I mean, they come, you can get them big ones. As, they're long, and some are, it depends on how many yards you want to put in there. But they had a big one that was full of that, that ripped off, of, off this home. But they didn't come overnight. That was left to grow on there. And so through this person's neglect and laziness, it grew. And things got destroyed. And look at verse 32. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. That's what a wise person does. They learn from things. Learn from observing. And take lessons in everything they see. A wise person will, not, will learn not only from their own mistakes, but from the mistakes of others. And this is the lesson that's found in verse 33. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little fold in the hands, then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an armed man. And Solomon says something similar in Proverbs 6. 
6 to 11, go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways, and be wise. Which, having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepare her food in the summer, and gather provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When you arise from your sleep, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little fold in the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond, and you need like an armed man. Is, there, is, is Solomon saying that we're to be workaholics? That there's no ever time for rest? That is not what he's saying. Because we find principles for rest in the fourth commandment. Exodus 20, 8-11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no... You should not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servants, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, the rest and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now we see that in, there's a reason why God rested on the seventh day. It's not because he was tired and exhausted but setting a principle for us that we work six days and rest. And we rest to worship God. For the Israelites, they rested on the seventh day to worship God. And Saturday is no longer our, our day of rest and worship. Sunday is our day to rest and worship, to worship God. The world uses Sunday as a a day of rest as well because you often talk to people oh that's only my only day that's only my day of rest that's the only day that I'm not working so I'm just going to use it to do whatever I want that's not what Christians do we we rest and we come to worship the Lord we observe Sundays differently than than the Israelites observe the Sabbath on Saturdays but we have this principle of working six days and rest on the seventh we also have sleep at night as well. People, de diff people, depending on what stage of life they're in, need different, le more sleep or less sleep. But we all need sleep. Whether it be eight hours or nine hours or ten hours or seven hours, we all need rest. And then as well as there's nothing wrong with naps. We hear of the benefits of even napping. Take, just taking a, a nap during the day. There's cultures who take a siesta. For the day, everything closes down in the early afternoon and they take a rest, a nap. And so what Solomon is describing is not this principle of rest and this principle of an, even a nap or sleep. No, no. That's not, he's describing something that is far different. Because look at verses 34 and 35, 33 and 34 again. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little fold in the hands of rest. Then your poverty will come as a robber and you want like an armed man. It's all that person did was rest. That's all they did. They didn't work. That's why their property was in shambles. That's why their wall was falling down. That's why the, their, their vineyard is, they, they can't even get food from their vineyard if they wanted to because it's overgrown with thorns and thistles and all that going on. Their life was just a little bit more. Let me just, a little bit more sleep. A little more. Because of that, they're left destitute because of laziness. Most of us are not physically lazy. Sometimes we might be lazy in a little area that we don't want to do, start this project right away. We don't want to do this home project or whatever it may be. But most of the time, the reality of where we can become lazy in is spiritually, in different ways. One is by allowing the weeds of sin to grow and by making excuses for our sin. That here we just, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. If we see somebody else commit that same sin, we'd be like, oh, they are a wicked person. But when we, but in our own lives, 
be like, you know what, that's not that big of a deal. You know what, it's not, not that big of a deal at all. And that's how we come, start becoming spiritually lazy, is by making excuses for sin. When we should be digitally confe- diligently confessing and forsaking sin. 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We become spiritually lazy by not reading God's Word, by not praying, not coming to church service when we're physically able to. People can be lazy spiritually by not repenting and believing the gospel, but by putting it off. Some people, they think, well, you know what? I will do that when I'm older. I'll wait a better time in my life. But the problem is is that it becomes too late. They'll say, ah, you know what, I'll... I'll do what I want in this life, and then I'll wait to the end of my life. But how do you know that you won't get Alzheimer's, dementia, and forget those things? And it's too late. How do you know that the Holy Spirit will just, just let you be? Because of your choices. No longer convict you. That you put it off until it's too late. Because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to respond. The laziness of not repenting and believing, but putting it off is going to lead a person to hell. When today is the day of salvation, today is the day to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. And put your faith and trust in Him.